minds were just blown when you said that. Am I ruining this show for people who have never seen it? You can take English and you can turn it inside out. Somebody please find out how you join ISIS. <laughs> So uh, like it, it, six times as good as like I, We sound drunk, but we're just being Latina. We're, <laughs> oh, we're just getting started. Uh, Melissa Rosenberg, Nick Manson, Yet Tan Wen, Stephen Canal, Robin Costa Lewis, Rami Youssef, Gloria Calderon, Tanya Saracho, Chris Marcus, and Stephen McFeely. It's rough draft, it's rough draft, it's rough draft. This one's for you. Hey, everybody, welcome to Rough Draft Live, brought to you by 92nd Street Y and Topic Studios. I'm your host, Reza Aslan, and I'm so excited about tonight. Um, our guest is the front man for the band Airborne Toxic Event and the author of this incredible memoir, um, Hollywood Park, which, look, th those of you who know me know I don't always read the book, okay? <laughs> I don't always read the book. Sometimes I pretend to read the book. I have other people read the book and tell me what it's about. I read this book and it is fantastic. Mikel Jolet is joining us from his house in Silver Lake. Mikel, what's up? Hi, Reza. How you doing, man? It's so nice to have you on this show. I've been looking forward to this all week. This is... This is <laughs> hey, uh, first I of all... Like I'm not sure if it was a good idea to tell everyone we were going to get drunk together, but... I just like now I feel like we have to live up to it though. Like, now speaking of on. getting drunk, uh cheers. Uh we're enjoying uh a drink, the drink for you, as a matter of fact. We call it the airborne on ice, a little whiskey, some uh lemon juice. I gotta tell you, I'm I'm more of a bourbon guy. Not you know, really you, can only, you know, in bourbon that thing like with bourbon, it's it can only be in Louisville. And if it's not in Louisville, then it's not bourbon, right? Isn't that <laughs> that's the right? Thing? That's a, I think that's what I say. And you can tell if you've ever been in a fight in Louisville or not, because you went to Louisville and you said Louisville, and they get very, <laughs> very upset. If you say, if you, any of you in Kentucky, if you, if you're in Louisville and you say, sorry, if you're in Louisville and you say Louisville, people get very pissed mm. off. You'll, you'll get well, socked for that. I call it Louisville. Is that not right? No. <laughs> That's because right. you're on the left. <laughs> Listen, a, uh, I just want to say a liberal. That's a liberal thing. To that say. is that is exactly that's what we are liberal. In, listen, pronunciation of Louisville in Joe Biden's America, it's all going to be Louisville. Did you see the so, Joe Biden thing today, where there was no no race? Trump was the first racist president. Did you that see was, that? That was not okay. It's like Joe. I mean, obviously, yeah. Joe wasn't my guy. I was very vocally a Warren person. <laughs> you know, I love me Louisville. too. Warren, and then after that, I don't know, probably Bernie. But like, oh my God, like, <laughs> like I like Please Joe because I'm an Obama guy in person and foremost. But like, really, do you really yeah. Andrew Jackson? Anyone? Okay. I guess, I guess you know he's he's, he's got to he, have a clan ceremony in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> he's got listen. He's got to, he's got to appeal to all those white racists who are like. Man, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was okay voting for Trump once when he was like Mexicans or rapists, but now I don't know. I'm just one now it might hurt off. my family. What am I going to do? But hurt <laughs> that's my right. Family? I mean, that's I knew right. I, I was kind of fine with these little El Salvadorian children being <laughs> thrown into a fucking cage, but if it hurts my family, I mean, my kids might not go to school. Do you realize how stressful that's going to be? That's if right. Kids can't go to school. That's right. That's when the yeah, shit really goes I down. I do realize that. Have you been to a fucking border <laughs> camp lately? Sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're yeah, 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 yeah. So let's back up, back up, back up. Hey, listen, first of all, congratulations, man, uh, on this book, a New York Times bestseller. How does that how does that feel? I, it's really weird. I, I, I kept getting all these. Um, I kept doing all this stuff with it and the book kept kind of growing. And I just kept thinking, like, it's such a sad book. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> vulgar at time that I'm just like, why, why, like, I just, I think of things like that being for, I don't know, cookbooks, maybe, I don't know, political, but like a different <laughs> type of person than like me talking about, you know, hippies in the eighties that went to Oregon to hide Yeah, it that, that it is. And so it's like, I, I was surprised and pleasantly surprised. And I, I will say I worked really hard on it. So, um, I guess, you know, when I was writing it, I felt like, um, I was really onto something and it felt special. Uh, when I was, I was in it, you know, you're in a zone sometimes when you write a story. And so that, yeah. that felt good. And I worked so hard at it, but yeah, it feels good. It feels weird. 
It feels like uh, I should do another one. I should write a novel. You should have, yeah, keep going. It's not yeah. bad. Um, the book is this kind of beautiful distillation of self-exploration, confusion, childhood, agony, uh, a damaged upbringing. There are recipes in there. No, I'm just kidding. There so are no good recipes. For, I was going to say, so good at dinner parties. <laughs> yeah, great for dinner parties. What are you looking for a uh, light but, banter? Here's the thing. Here's the thing that I like about it is that I think maybe some people out there who know you as a rock star are like, "Oh, a rock star wrote a book." I mean, it's like, don't we have those already? Yeah. Yeah. But this is not. This is not a rock star memoir, right? Well, this first is, of all, there are no rock stars else. except Jack White. <laughs> that, that just doesn't exist. The rest of us are just like guys in bands or people in bands. You know, there's not rock stars. I'm not there's a rock Jack guy. White. I have two kids. I live with my wife. We're just hunkered down like everyone else. <laughs> So there's there's Jack White because he embodies it. He really embodies it. The rest of us were not rock stars. We're just we're just we're in a. I'm in a touring band. I would say I'm a troubadour. Maybe you're a you're a working musician. A working musician. You're a working musician, which is like yeah, like a dream come true. Period. Uh, but tell me, tell me about this. Tell me very happy how, did, about how things turned out. How how did how did the sort of idea of writing this book come across? I mean, it's important for people to understand that. You are a writer. I mean, you you wrote nonfiction, journalism, fiction, um, and then you became a musician and a, a singer. So yeah. it's not like you were just a musician who was like, "Hey, maybe I'll write a book and see how it goes." Yeah. Um, so you you had this inside of you for a while, but but tell me about the the genesis of of sitting down and saying, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my childhood on." Well, down. My hope was that you didn't need to know anything about you know, me or my career or my band. I, and we're just an indie rock band. We're not a particularly big indie rock band. Arcade Fire is a big indie rock band, you know. Um, we're just- a Six albums, band. that's not, I mean, come on. No, listen, I'm not trying to diminish it. I'm very proud of the work we've done, you know, but it's like, no one gives a shit about if I write a memoir based on that part of my life. What I was trying to do was write about, uh, write a story that you could read. I wanted it to be a piece of literature. Um, in, in addition to, I didn't want it to be some like terrible memoir of someone who took himself too seriously. I mm -hmm. also didn't want it to just be a memoir. I was interested in using some of the, let's call them devices of fiction. Uh, the book has an unreliable narrator. The book has magical realism. These are big no-nos in the world of memoir. If you read like Art of Memoir, right. by Mary Carr, like number one is make sure they always know you're telling the truth. And it's like page two, my mom turns into yeah. a bird and flies away. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Flies all over the place. And, and I did that on purpose. Um, uh, partially because it was just felt more exciting. So you're following your instincts as a writer and partially because I I started to notice that this, they felt real because that's how it felt to be a child. That's how it mm. actually felt. And then, you know, if we're going to be a little more profound or pointy headed about it, I think that's probably the way we organize our identities. We don't, we don't simply organize our identities based on sort of logic and historical events. We are, we are unreliable narrators of our own existence. We mm -hmm. have a lot of magical realism in our lives. That's, explains totems that explains a lot of religion as you've written about extensively that explains sort of mythologies across cultures that explains i don't know astrology like we we organize our identities around magical realistic events ideas thoughts metaphor which is not typically considered the province of memoir um is the province of storytelling storytelling is the province of identity so i just felt fuck it like let's let's go yeah. deep to how i thought about the world as a child and let's, you know, let's have people turn into animals and let's mm -hmm. burrow beneath the ground by a thousand feet at one point in order to be able to talk to the future. At one point, I'm literally in dialogue with the future self writing the book. Like, right. it's all fucked up. But it, but I think on the page, it makes sense. And as I was writing it, and, you know, there's some, actually, I'm just being a little coy. Like, there are some literary reasons for why I did what I did. But um, well, we're going to talk about those literary reasons. <laughs> you, you brought up Mary Carr. Um, I wonder... Uh, were there are there memoirs out there that like were influential to you? I mean, did you read The Liars Club? You know, yeah. I read all of them. I read all the yeah. all the classics, all the modern even the, even like the even the rock star memoirs. No, because I, I don't care about them. <laughs> no, no, you didn't read. Uh, you didn't read. Uh, Patty I didn't read Bruce's book. I didn't read Two Hearts. I didn't. You know, I, none of that. I, I uh, first of all, I'm a Bruce Springsteen fan, but I want the Bruce Springsteen of the mind. I don't want I don't want to actually come to terms with any I want Bruce Springsteen such a fantastical figure in my mind that can never be surpassed that I knew I'd only be disappointed. <laughs> so <laughs> like, with the sort of like the ben creation. Kenobi. Yeah. He's a Ben Kenobi figure in my head. Right, like he appears right. as, a, as a you know, he's like a ghost on the side. He's like, Mikhail, stop fucking up. And then I'm like, oh, shit, I'm fucking up. And then I'm oh, sorry, I, Bruce. Okay, what would Bruce do? 
and then I, I can I can correct. And I knew if I read it, it, it you know, and and I was interested in um, you know the memoirs that had touched me. So you know, I know why the Cage Bird sings. First of all, mm -hmm. that book is like you think you got a book, you know, a book. You know, <laughs> yeah, a book. You, think you, a you think book? you know how to write? You know how to write. You 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 know how to write when every page is special. This book, every <laughs> page is special. Every page has a bit of poetry, wisdom, storytelling, insight. Uh, just a fantastic paragraph that bowls you over. So that book, Angela's Ashes, um, This Boy's Life, those both of those books were about scheming preteens, scheming children, you know, all the ways in which we as children yeah. lie to ourselves, lie to other people, you know, steal and and we're also yeah. dealing with crazy challenging situations that the adults put on us. So that that was very influential. And then a couple of novels, uh, Beloved by Toni Morrison. Mm. Um, she's like Roger Federer or like Michael Jordan. Like she's no holes in her game. Mm -hmm. Like she's mm -hmm. just, I'm glad I came to that book later in life. I never, you know, I didn't study it or anything. And um, it's just so mysterious and weird and probing and vexing. It's probably my favorite book and she's probably my favorite writer. And, and, and it just reminded me to not talk down to my reader. Let yeah. the world that is as mysterious and weird and, you know, frankly, complex uh, and funny at times and strange as it exists in my head. Let that be what the reader sees. Don't don't dumb it down. Don't try to yeah. put yourself on a stage. And then the, the things they carried by Tim, Tim O'Brien, which is mm -hmm. uh, a book about Vietnam soldiers. Uh, that's sort of a memoir, sort of a novel. So those those were kind of the big hits for me when writing this book. I, I read about 150 books and took a lot of notes and wrote a lot of essays trying to get sort of form down and thinking about technique and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you, the, the books that you mentioned, like you were saying about this book, Hollywood Park, do bend the genre a little bit, do play with it, the expectations of the, the reader, the multiple points of view. One of the things that you do in this book, you kind of brought it up already, is like the basically the first third of it is deliberately written from the perspective of you as a child. Right. And, you know, for for all the, the writers out there, right, there's a difference between point of view and perspective. Point of view is what the eye sees. Perspective is what the mind knows. And there is a That's way a to create. Little, hello, Professor Aslan. Can yeah, I, I, do, I do this for a living. I um, want to be in like the front row with my notepad. Like <laughs> if I was a sophomore in college, that would be on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> and well, so but this is what's fascinating is that there are certain writers who are good enough to really play tricks with point of view and perspective by marrying them sometimes. And so the first third of this book is from the perspective of you as a child. So many memoirs are about the adult writing about the past. In fact, that's yeah. what memoir means. It's a it's about it's about capturing a moment of time yeah. from this different perspective. But you eschew your adult perspective and you lock us into the perspective of the child. And so what that does, you brought up an unreliable narrator. Yeah, it creates a little bit of an unreliable narrator, but what's even more fascinating is that it creates a sense uh, in which the, the, the reader is unmoored, like the reader doesn't know what's going on. Like we know only what this little child knows, right? right? And so, Everything is so mysterious and confusing and nothing makes sense. And the adults around him are just all insane and the world is insane. And because you've locked us there, we can't help but feel that same sense. And, and one of the things that it does, and this, this is where, where I'm getting to, is that it allows you to kind of uncover this buried history right? This, this, this secret truth. Um, and to sift through all of these like false narratives you've been fed as a child. And we're going to talk about what that means in a moment here, but all the false narratives you were fed about who you are, what you actually think, what you actually believe. Um, and so I guess the, 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 the heart of the question that I want to get to is when you do something like that, right? It's, it's, a, it's a clever trick and you pull it off beautifully. Thanks. But when you do something like that, when you, when you give equal weight to what you, Mikkel, as a little kid thought was happening mm -hmm. and what you, Mikkel, as an adult now know what's happening, you give both of those things kind of equal weight in, in the book. Is it harder to write about uh, the reality 
that you know was happening? Or is it harder to write about what you were told was the reality of the time? Right? I Which think that your experience with it is the reality. And that's the whole point. That's how we understand stories. We are never objective about our own stories. Never. Mm. And the best jokes that we know have a perspective. The best stories that we've ever heard have a perspective. And so the most powerful way for you to understand, like, okay, so one of the pivotal scenes in the book is, you know, I come outside to watch um, on the street in Berkeley. We've escaped the cult. We've been living on the run. And our roommate comes home in his VW van and he gets beat into a coma, you know, five feet in front of me. That, yeah. that was a really hard moment in my life. I really wanted to capture it um, on, in the book as it happened. Now, I've read about that story in the press. I've read about myself being involved in that story in the press yeah. because it mentions a little boy in the um, Point Reyes light piece about that, which is the newspaper that won a Pulitzer writing about Synanon, which is the cult that we escaped. Um, I've heard that story from friends, and I did a long interview with Phil uh, Ritter, who was the our roommate, and I did that contemporary. The guy who was beaten. Writing the, book. Yeah. the guy was beaten. So I I knew the facts on the ground. Now if I now I just told you the story right now. Guy was beaten in front of, into a coma five feet in front of me. I was five years old, um, nearly five years old. And uh, that um, that that doesn't tell you what happened. If we're hanging out and we're friends and I tell you um, that I wasn't allowed to go outside and it was because I was told that the bad men were going to come. And I had this I didn't know who my dad was um, because we didn't have parents and we lived in an orphanage and then we had to escape and then. I, we moved in with a roommate and that roommate was kind to me. So there was this warmth. And even though he wasn't a father figure, there was a father like energy. Cause I was just so desperate for a fatherly figure in my life that I was just really happy to see him whenever he came home. And one day when I'm finally let out to play, I come, he comes home with groceries. We smile, our eyes lock and two men with nylon masks on walk up behind him and hit him over the head. And he falls over like a stack of Lincoln logs just immediately just fell and he starts screaming and I'm, I don't know what to do. My brother's across the street. He's with a group of kids. They've all stopped what they're doing and they're just, they start beating him. There's blood yeah. mingling with the gravel on the driveway. There's um, my brother and I trying to figure out what to do. I'm, I'm hiding. Eventually one of the men rears up and says, where are Mikel and Tony? Because the bad men that we've been hiding from have finally come. Isn't that more what the story is? Yeah. And so my point is, and I'm not trying to be trite, like that is actually a very traumatic thing that happened. My point is I always wanted the reader to know the emotional truth as I went through it. And I was working from the um, sort of theory that it didn't matter what the objective truth was now in this kind of 40 year old elegiac kind of way where I'm looking back on life and going, well, I've now, you know, I don't, I don't care. What matters to the story is how did I feel? What did I think? What did I imagine what was happening? And then how did this affect, let's say, the ontological reality of my life? And those are things I thought about in every single scene in the book. And if given it, given that perspective, the story becomes way more vital, way more real. And if I can follow, if I can bring you as a reader through 40 years of that, then I think I can present to you what I try to do at the end of the book, which is some conclusions about um, my life having survived some of that and some yeah. things that sort of know to be true, some decisions that I've made. And we can be friends intellectually, which is what a book is, a good memoir. Hi, you wanna be my friend? You wanna know how life was for me in this world? Let me tell you. And that's yeah. my goal in the book. So I, I threw out the idea of truth on page you know, one. I don't care. I care about the emotional truth. Everything happened, there's, no, there's nothing made up in the book. But in terms of the perspective, what mattered to me was you know, and, and I, I try to clue the reader in like, you know, when some of the things that aren't true aren't true, they, they know it's not true. Yeah. I'm repeating things that aren't true. But then that's sort of like that's the journey of kids who survived emotional abuse is they were told lies and they slowly unpack those lives over a lifetime. And then they came to, to new conclusions. And so that was the perspective that I tried to establish in the book and try to be a little revolutionary is the wrong word. But let's say um, rebellious or maybe experimental where like, I just completely went the other direction of like, I don't care what actually happened. I care very much about what I thought was happening. Yeah. And for you to go through that with me as a reader and know what my experience was as I slowly piece this puzzle together in my life. 
Can we talk about the bad men uh, and yeah. and the cult that you escaped sending on? You 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 mentioned it. I'm sure you know you've been asked about it a thousand times. So it, instead of just me asking questions, it, can you just explain to everyone what what was sending on and and your um, sort of experience of it? It's annoying because you don't want to have to take responsibility for your parents' annoying decisions. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't choose to, like, oh, born in a cult. And you're like, I didn't fucking chose to be in a cult. I'm an Obama Democrat. I'm a pragmatist. <laughs> Maybe to a fault. Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna criticize Obama for anything, the Gen X president, it's that he was too pragmatic. <laughs> that we probably That's needed you. To be a little more yeah. ideologue at times and needed to have a little bit more, you know. But I love Obama. I'm not gonna criticize him. My point is that I'm not like that. I don't, I wouldn't, I believe in institutions. I believe in turning institutional power to benefit others. My parents weren't that. My parents, my father was, a, um, uh, he had, he had, uh, he had had a life of crime, let's say, and mm -hmm. in prison. He, he was disorganized sorry, crime. Disorganized crime. We used to ask my dad, is it like organized crime? He's like, yeah, more like disorganized crime. But from the time he was 15 on, my father was a criminal. Um, and uh, for about 10 years, that's what he did. And he had a huge rap sheet. Um, and you know, uh, he only made it to like eighth grade. Um, and, uh, while he was in Chino, he's locked up in Chino prison, uh, for years. Uh, he, he's got a heroin addiction and when he got out, of, he needed to get clean. And one day he overdosed and there's a song about this on the record. Um, he overdosed and then someone dropped him off at this drug rehabilitation facility called Synanon. And what it was, was a place where, uh, drug addicts lived together in order to try and collectively, you know, kick uh, uh, their addictions. And this was like a heroin crisis happening in the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. There's like an opioid crisis now. That was the opioid crisis of the day. So it worked. It was great. Um, and then uh, for a while, all these addicts living together and screaming at each other in this kind of attack group therapy called The Game, and people got clean. And then um, the Lifestylers moved in, which we call the squares. You could call them the hippies. I don't know. Mm. Uh, and my mom was a square. She was a... a masters in berkeley uh, free speech activist um who you know was part of the sit-ins at berkeley and all that kind of stuff um you know mario Salvo and all that kind of like mm -hmm. you never lay down on the gears yeah. of society until you stop the machine because the machine it's like some of the best rhetoric you've ever heard by the way if you're going to be an activist you know study <laughs> free speech in berkeley just for the rhetorical devices they're tremendous <laughs> Um, so she, um, she moved in to change the world and then the place got this idea that it was going to change the world and, uh, it became a cult because, uh, there was a lot of isolated power, um, and the power fell into the hands of one person, this guy, Chuck Dietrich, who was kind of the leader. And they started doing some really crazy stuff, breaking up marriages, uh, forcing vasectomies, forcing ab abortions, violence, which was, it started as a nonviolent place, became violent. They bought like a thousand guns at one point, yeah. rough people up, attempted murder, you name it. Um, and that's when, uh, and then the worst thing I would say that happened was um, they had a place where they put all the children and at six months old, all the children were taken away from their parents and put into an orphanage. And that's where my brother and I were raised when we were yeah. there. We lived in an orphanage. That was, that was sort of the big thing about Synanon, right? As it became a cult was this notion that children should have no parents, right? That they should be, you know, a, a child of the universe, as right. as as it was put. And the goal was quite clearly to create um, a new kind of person who right. didn't need parents. Like that was the that was the key that we can create a new kind of human being who is utterly detached from the past, it, uh, doesn't need parents, and can just rely on themselves. And I I always find that part of the cult so fascinating for a whole host of reasons one because i'm curious what kind of person that is you know like what what kind of person is it who is utterly detached from the past and the legacy also because i kind of get it a little bit you know i mean for look for for a lot of us who have had very fraught um relationships with their parents, right? Um, and who uh, feel like, you know, we carry an enormous amount of baggage, you know, from our upbringing and from from toxic relationships with, you know, our, our family members. You know, part of it is that we do when we grow up have this idea that we can be free of that legacy, right? That I don't, I don't have to be the person that my dad was, yeah. um, that I can, I can escape it somehow. I'm my own person. I'm not affected 
by right. what happened to me um, as a child. I mean, I don't know if you feel this way. The the worst insult that anyone can say to me that to to truly hurt me, uh, and, and my mom is very good at doing this to me when she really wants to, uh, is she'll say you're just like your dad, oh, and wow. I am I'm speechless when that when <laughs> you know I've I've lost the argument. Yeah, you were like a living experiment. Well, I want right? to hear more about your upbringing now. Now that I'm going to, I'm, well, I'm going to share a little, 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 couple, we're, we're, little, we're, little we're, more of this. And we're, we're going to start talking, we're going to start talking about our dads. We're going to start crying. I'm it's like, not... I put all, I put all this story into this book that everyone gets to read. I've, I've got all my fucking, there are no secrets in my fucking life anymore. So. <laughs> I get, look, this is what I'm saying is that what everyone, what I think everyone who reads this book can relate to is this idea that the push and pull of our parents, right? That we don't want to be like them. Right? I don't want to yeah. be like you, but I also love you so much of who you are is me. I, I, you know, the older I get too, I look in the mirror and I see my dad looking back at me and I don't know how to respond. And if someone comes up and says, you don't need any of that, you can, you can just kind of like slice that part of you away and it doesn't exist and you're a wholly new person. I, I understand the appeal of that. Yeah. But I but as someone who actually was the living example of that experiment, my question is that who is that person? Who I mean, what is the person? Answer. It's not a great answer. We were abused and neglected and yeah. it was awful. And every kid in Synanon was abused. I I I'm like like I get what you're saying. Um and I don't I don't fault you for for thinking that way because I, I can see where that would be like, well maybe that's a you know, but like I mean Kids were molested. Kids were locked in closets. Kids were, right, kids yeah. were ritualistically shamed. Kids were humiliated. Kids were unprotected. Every kid was neglected in some form or another. Every That means neglect is a form of abuse. We didn't have parents. And that's, this is what happens in orphanages. All these things are what happen in orphanages. Yeah. Then, which is why you know we don't have an orphanage system in the United States anymore. I mean, it's all foster care because in institutional settings, this happens. And sometimes it happens at the hands of the caretaker. Sometimes it happens at the sure. hands of older kids that's often you know what happens and and in our story um you know it it was it, it was lonely i mean i think it's very otherizing to be like i was born in a cult and put in an orphanage it sounds like how do you even relate to something like i don't know how to relate to something like that you know mm -hmm. but the the real truth of it was that it was it was lonely it was hard it was um and it taught you uh, you know certain different kids responded in different ways my brother responded by becoming a rebel being angry and so he was much he, older. He was older, yeah. And he, mm. and he, in some ways, his response was kind of more honest, maybe more healthy. I responded by becoming what they call a super child. You know, I'm going to take care mm -hmm. of everyone. I'm going to mm -hmm. take care of mom who's severely depressed, and I'm going to cook for everyone, and I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go and do three hours of chores. I'm going to, you know, I'm jumping ahead, but we later, you know, raised rabbits for for food because we we were very poor. We we're living on food stamps and. And I, I was the one who raised and slaughtered the rabbits. I was the one who did, I, I don't know, maybe three to five hours of chores a day when I was eight. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it didn't cross my mind that that wasn't normal because that's what I was told. I was told this was the normal thing. I was, and it suited me because um, I was sort of by nature like, this is what happens to kids in orphanages. You learn to dance. You learn to dance for your supper. You learn to dance for attention. You learn to... Because you don't have a parent. You don't have the primary attachment. You don't have any of that. So you're like, oh, I've got to win this person over. Okay, I'm going to win them over. I'm going to be cute. I'm going to be funny. I'm going to be interact. They're going to be like, look at me. Kelly's so mm -hmm. special. And I learned very early on how to make people think I was so special. It's funny. I did this thing with Bob Boylan the other day that uh, on NPR, who Bob Boylan of Tiny Desk fame, who um, I used to do pieces for on NPR when I was on All Things Considered back in another lifetime. And he... Um, he and I got into this whole thing about, about that and how like, why do so many people like that become artists? And I think it's because we're writers and it's because you're so otherized all the time. You're always an observer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're just sitting back. You feel like everyone else is sharing a reality. I'm not sharing. And all I'm doing is trying to look at all the faces and try to figure out what's required of me. And I think immigrants feel that way a lot of the time. I definitely think child children of addiction, children of abuse um, feel that way. I think racism functions that way in, in, in some in some ways. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you're just otherized. And so what are you doing? You're, you're putting on a mask, you're putting on a show. And that's what I learned to do. And I, I rode that for a long, long time in my life. Like probably till I was like 27, 28 years old. I, I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to outwork this thing, you know, but the, the short answer is it sucked. We were abused. Yeah. This, this idea of wearing a mask is something that shows up a lot. It's like a refrain in, in, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and you've, talked about the book as a kind of unmasking, Absolutely. right? Yeah. No, it, it, I, like I learned to stop telling these stories when I was maybe 12. I was yeah. 12 years old and I think I'd moved in with my dad in LA and I was just, I, if someone said, where are you from? I just got sick of the way people looked at me. If I said, oh, I'm from, you know, Synanon or I'm from, so, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people do this. You, you figure out a story that you tell about yourself. You emphasize certain attributes, just certain life events. You you sort of don't mention others. You skip over mm -hmm. certain years, certain relationships, certain people, <laughs> and you paint a picture of a person that they've now yeah. just yeah. You construct an identity. Yeah, it's only intensified in college because I was at I ended up at Stanford, and you know Stanford is a great place, but it's all about winning. You want yeah. gonna win. It's all like kind of like positivity. My wife has this expression: toxic positivity. <laughs> <laughs> which I like quite a bit. Yeah, we're not going to admit when things are bad. We're just going to try to talk about how everything's great or pretend it didn't affect us. And, you know, um, so I, yeah. I, and in my whole life, I just, I, I got sick of being like getting that look like that people give you. If you tell them, yeah, I was born in a cult and put in an orphanage. That's a tough one at a dinner party. That's yeah, man, I got sick exactly. of like I'm this wild dog off a leash. And particularly because for me, like I said before, I'm not like that. I, I wanted the scholarship to Stanford and I thought about running for mayor and I thought about like, and I had a career as a writer before being a musician and all that stuff. So for me, it was like, you know, fuck all this. I don't want to, I don't want to participate. I don't want people to, I don't really brand it. I don't want my identity to be these things. I want to be able to choose and forge my own identity. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, so here you are, this kind of, you know, product of an experiment that says, you don't need a family and then you're pulled from it you know when you're when you're young uh your mom basically just kind of pulled you and your brother and and got the fuck out like escaped um, yeah. Yeah. and so much of the rest of your childhood your parents are, uh, are not together so you're going back and forth between your mom and you're starting to get to know who your dad was and yeah. so much of your childhood is this attempt to gain back that thing that was ripped away from you, you know, when, when you were a child, which is family, this family. idea of family, like what is a family? What does it mean to be a family? It's a constant um, issue um, in the book. There's this line that you have where you, you say the word family, the word seems to me like a cave, something big and simple. You can walk inside to get away from a storm called loneliness. Talk to me about that. What is, what is the the connection between family and loneliness for you as a, as a child? Well, I think at that point we're in Salem, Oregon. That's the chapter that is about the AA campouts that we go to because my stepfather, my first stepfather, had moved in. He was a dear man, but he was a he was a severe alcoholic. And we would go to AA meetings up in the woods, uh, Detroit Lake, which was um, east of uh, Salem, Oregon, up in the mountains there, uh, in the Cascades. It was beautiful, and we would have mm -hmm. these big meetings and a storytellers are great storytellers like the best storytellers in the world some of the best storytellers are, are they're not doing ted talks they're they're at an AA meeting yeah they know how to land a joke they understand an intro you know what i mean they understand mm -hmm. how to finish and and we sat there for years just going up to these campouts and listening to these guys talk about you know um their stories which were filled with abuse and you know drinking and drugs and you know guns and all kinds of crazy stuff so i mean there's if you're going to be a writer there are worse ways to grow up <laughs> <laughs> be forever exposed to these like crazy fucking stories that you don't bet and i had nine years old i could have told you what like child protective services was and like what a 22 bullet looked like you know <laughs> well as a matter as a matter of fact you uh, there are these sort of great moments where you um, practice repeating certain sentences oh, yeah, yeah. and lines that you people yeah. say, right? Like just the way well, that they the say it, the like, rhythm. We had, a, we had a single mom for a long time before the stepdad. And, and I think if you're the sons of a single mom, there's this, I don't use the word toxic masculinity in the book because it's not something I understood at that age. And, and, um, 
that isn't really what the book's about. But there is this notion that, um, you know, uh, we're, we're sort of inventing what a man is as we grow up. And a lot of that just gets based usually on your father or a rejection of your father. And we mm -hmm. there was no men around. We knew the world of women. We knew like when our mom would talk to her friend Debbie and they would play cards and discuss like who she was going to maybe start dating. And she would show up in the room one day and she'd have makeup on and we knew she was going on a date. And you have to understand, we knew how desperately she wanted a husband. We knew it. We felt it. And that's a real thing. Like, I mean, here she is. She's, I think, 37. She's got two kids. She's escaped a cult. She's penniless. She's got some mental health issues. And she's and, lonely. And she's lonely. And we knew that loneliness. And, and you understand, that wasn't necessarily the best thing for us to know. Because it taught us a few things. One, it, we had we were fascinated by men too. Who are these hairy beasts that show up and, and like have trucks and know how to go hunting and fishing and they can throw us in the air and they've got muscles and beards and weird hair patterns because you know whatever. Like that that was a weird thing. And then also I think later in life we we sort of knew something about the internal world of women in a way that maybe wasn't even good for us. You know, maybe we, we identified so strongly that sometimes maybe I would say I probably stayed in a few relationships I should have left because I just was so worried about hurting, you know, the person I was with. And you could say, oh, well, there's worse things. I agree. I'm just saying what it did was it taught me not to think about my own needs. It was like one of many things that sort of taught me that. So anyways, the, the point I'm sort of driving at is when it comes to family, a lot of what we did was play act. A lot of what we did early on was Okay, you're the mom. Okay, and that guy's the dad this week. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this week he's the dad. Okay, all right. So if one of you and we're the kids, so what does that mean? What's what are our relationships with each other? Because we didn't know. You have to understand, we were in the orphanage. Yeah. And, the orphanage well, well, parents. and so when this woman, we were told there's this woman named Mom. When she showed up to get us, it did, the, the name didn't have any particular meaning. We didn't know. We were we hardly saw her. We saw her once every few weeks for a few hours. Was it? Mm -hmm. So. We were always trying to invent it. We were always trying to, we were always sort of fascinated by it. And I think my brother and I were always felt like outsiders looking in, in a way that like now as an adult, as a parent, I have two kids, like, you know, I, I, I've seen my kids every day. I pick them up every day. I, I'm a dad. I love being a dad. It's a different thing. We had no instincts about that. None. We just did. The whole thing mm -hmm. was a fucking mystery to us. Your mom, as you sort of now recognize, had um, narcissistic personality disorder, um, had, you know, created obviously a very toxic uh, parent-child relationship, one in which you were told constantly that it was your job to take care of her, mm -hmm. um, and one in which you had to constantly deny your emotions, your experience of things, right? Um, you just talked about a little while ago that pivotal moment in which you saw <clears throat> Phil, this man that you love, being beaten almost to death yeah. by these scary men who your mom told you was were coming for you. And the remarkable thing about that story is that when you told your mom what happened, she told you, no, you didn't see that. You weren't there. You didn't experience that. When you told your mom you were sad, she would say, no, you're not sad. You're you're happy. You're fine. Everything is great. This, this constant sense of your emotions are wrong. Right. What you think is happening isn't happening, right? right? Um, I mean, that's got to create a, a kind of almost schizophrenia you know, growing up, well, like you don't even know, like, am I, is reality really what, um, what is, I think is happening? Is my experience of reality true or not? Are these emotions, am I mislabeling them? You know, yeah, I mean, I was to write about that. Cause I, I, I wanted to write from the emotional perspective that I had at the time. Um, and cause I didn't, but I didn't have words for it to understand this, like the words narcissistic personality. Sorry. I don't think I ever uttered those words till about five years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I, all I knew was, you know, maybe as an adult, I had figured out, okay, something's kind of not right over here. Um, but as a kid, I didn't know any of that stuff. I just knew, all right, mom thinks this, which is weird because I kind of think this other thing's true. And it creates this schism, and which is that I experienced something and I'm being told I didn't experience it. So what does that teach me? Um, it teaches me to lie. It teaches me that people can lie. It teaches me the depth of lies that people can tell. It teaches me that you are sort of capable of creating a reality that doesn't sort of coexist 
you can you can create an emotional reality that's easier to handle than the one that actually exists. That's a that's a hell of a thing to teach a kid. <laughs> and so you know, I talk about these things in the book from the perspective of the eight year old and the ten year old going through it. But I now understand it. It was a, it was emotional abuse. I mean, that was that was, was that's what it was. It was emotional abuse. Yeah. And, and I and I try. I feel like um, when I talk about her, it's I don't I don't want to I don't want to put her down. I, it's hard to explain. It's hard. Because I, I don't feel like I want anyone who hasn't read the book to come away thinking that my mom was a monster because she wasn't. Um, she She's was not the villain of this story. No. Um, she's someone who struggled with um, uh, mental illness, depression, and um, NPD, BPD, cluster B kind of stuff, um, and also had a very hard life. And I think both those things can be true. And there's this desire to collapse these things in our culture. This person's an abuser. This person's a good person. This person does everything right. This person does everything wrong. And it's horseshit. That's just like not how the world works. And so um, I sort of feel like when you read the book, that's really clear. It's really clear and that it's possible for me to love her, even though I don't think she was very good at loving me, which is kind of the perspective mm -hmm. I learned by the end of the book. Um, but I, I want to be very clear for people who haven't read the book. I don't want to villainize her. It's not my it's not my goal. I don't think that's I don't think it's fair to her. It's also not true. It's also way more complex than that. You know, and so yeah. I don't want to try to reduce reduce it to these kind of these kind of tropes. Still, I don't think your mom comes across as the villain in the story, but your dad comes across as the hero in the story. He's a and great of guy. course, your dad, yeah, is a great guy. But I mean, you do recognize how much of that has to do with just kind of that bond that you were desperate for, right? I mean, you're you're with a mom who brings a bunch of men into your life and says, this is your dad. You know, this is your dad now. Now we're like a family. And then a week later, the guy's gone. Two, two months later, he's gone. Yeah. But you do have a dad and he's in a different place. And, you know, he's got his own issues, as you say, you know, he was a, he was a drug addict. And, um, but I, I wonder like when you were, when you were writing this book and you're being forced to go back, you know, a, a few decades and rewrite these stories, and re-examine the way that you thought when you were 11, right? When you're 11, your dad's your hero and your mom is, you know, uh, everything that's wrong, right? Um, and all you want to do is be like your dad and all you want to do is not be like way your around, actually. Right, okay, right. It's changed but, a couple uh, of times, but yeah. I it, it goes back and forth, right, exactly. Right. And I wonder, like, did your, did your perspective on your parents and who they were change when you sat down to write about them? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I absolutely. Um, I, I, um, my dad, what you have to understand about my dad. So he was clean my whole life. He's never, he never got a parking ticket the entire time I was alive. So all of his criminal or drug history was before I was born. So I never mm -hmm. saw it. It was always just this kind of mythology. And my brother and I would trade the mythology, like the little trading cards. We'd stay up late at night and be like, you know, dad was in a Mexican prison and you know, he, he busted out. And he did. He got sentenced to five years in a Mexican prison and they paid off a judge. And one day a bunch of people let him out of his doors and uh, let him out of his cell. And then the next and the next. And then eventually he went out into the street and he walked across the border. You know, um, there's a million stories like this that we had about our father. He, he carried a sawed off shotgun for, mm -hmm. for 10 years. He one time he he had a VW bus. And he crashed it into a wall and it collapsed like an accordion around him. And he thought he was going to be dead. And it just and then he kind of looked around like, <laughs> and then he, he climbed out, and then he went home and he reported it stolen. <laughs> he called the cops and said, "Someone stole my car." <laughs> See, but this is the perfect story. So you hear when when you hear this about your dad and you're 13, right? Uh, well, I was five. It's, it's whatever. It's the best story you've yeah. ever heard, and right. your dad is a hero about it. Yeah. Most, you know, the experience of growing up for the vast majority of us, I would say perhaps a little bit more, you know, for sons than daughters, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not, a, I only, I'm only a son, so I'm, I don't have the other perspective, but is this idea that the, the process of growing old is realizing that your parents aren't who you, who you thought they were. I know. I hear right? what you're saying. And I, that is definitely something I, I had to deal with, with my mom because my mom really was a difficult person to be mm -hmm. with. But you have to understand about my dad. He really was just a great guy. And by great guy, I don't mean he was funny and masculine. He was those things too. Mm -hmm. He was warm. He was wise. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody knew this about him. 
the kids on the street knew him. The family knew it. My brother knew it. Probably my mom knew it. Uh, he just had this way with people. He'd yeah. seen everything. He'd, he'd gotten clean off heroin. He'd helped a lot of other people gotten clean off heroin. There's a ton of people that say, Jim Gillette saved my life. And he was just affectionate, kind, warm, would give us the shirt off his back, would probably give anybody the shirt off his back, called his mother every day, was really good. to. He was like, he was like good in mm -hmm. his ways that are just really easy to understand as good. Gentle, affectionate, funny, warm, non-judgmental. And you could, he's this masculine guy that worked on cars and liked football. You know, but he fucking hated Republicans. <laughs> like, and he was sort of so. I guess politically, you know, he he was pretty astute. Um, he liked Hillary Clinton. I mean, I don't know for like this big masculine dude. Like, he was always like, they give her too much shit. She's a smart lady. Like, he was he was he wasn't that. And at one point, you know, he quit his job to take care of me because he knew I needed to be taken care of when I was moved up with them and let uh, my mom Bonnie, who's my stepmom, but we don't use the S word in my family. My mom Bonnie worked because her her career was was taking off and he was fine mm -hmm. with it. and that's yeah, he stayed home a really yeah. masculine man you know who and he was fine he was proud of her he said she's so good at what she does she's so good at her career she's you know she's going to be a breader she's taking care of everyone he was fine with it that's he mm -hmm. got to understand he was just a gem of a guy if you were to say to him you had mentioned earlier like you had some re relationships in your family that were toxic or difficult he'd be like okay so what were they and he could you could tell him whatever it is he wouldn't mm -hmm. deny <laughs> because he'd seen it all and and he would and when I talked to him, he would reason with me about my life. He'd say, you know, I'd say, Dad, this thing happened. I don't know. He's like, Well, you know, maybe you gotta gotta let it go. I don't. And then other times, be like, You got a problem there. You're gonna have to deal with this guy because otherwise, it's gonna come back. And you got, and he just had this way about him that I think everyone saw is good. I'm not saying that he was perfect. He was not a perfect person. Um, what I'm saying is that what I actually got to know as I got older was this guy I'd been told was kind of a grifter. Who I'd been told was an addict that I've been told had walked out on us. No, he just divorced our mom. And you right. know what? He probably divorced her because she was bad at being married to him because she had mental illness. And it was yeah. probably, and we were told because of that, he was this terrible guy. And he wasn't, he was actually just a gem of a human being. I mean, I, I you know, he, it was sort of like, and that was the reciprocity I wanted to happen in the book. I wanted there to be this moment where, you know, you go from thinking, Oh, the mom's going to be the hero. I think by the end of chapter three, you probably think my mom's going to be the hero of the book. And then my dad's like this shady character off that kind of ran out. And then there's this slow, like 150 page arc where you start to realize right. yeah, she's there's some, this isn't right. And then yeah. you see this person come in, my dad come in and be like, wow, those are, that's pretty solid, Jim. All right. Good, good, good. And, I, <laughs> and that's what I wanted. I wanted it to, cause that's how I discovered it in my own life. Yeah. This book, I gotta be honest, was, it, it was hard. It was hard for me to read that there were a, a, what was a lot of moments. Hard part. Well, look, I mean, you know, I don't have a mother who has a narcissistic person, narcissistic personality disorder, but I have a mother who's Persian, which is almost the same thing. I have a Jewish very, family. very close, we very close. Guilt. <laughs> I mean, I have a mom who, you know, if I if I eat before I come over, threatens suicide. So, you know, that's, she's like, you ate. <laughs> okay, I just die. Who cares about me then? Um, and, and you know, and I have a. And I have a and I have a dad who, like yours, tried really hard. Um, and you know, now as a as a grown up, I think back on it and I think that was his best. That was really his best, you know. Um, but it wasn't I don't know, it wasn't enough. It wasn't what I what I needed, it wasn't what I was yeah. looking for. Interesting, I mean, this is a connection. Our 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 fathers passed away at, around the same year, actually. Oh, I'm in sorry 20, 2015. Yeah. And um, and so you know, reading this book, I had I, I there were so many times where I had to put the book down and go upstairs and hug my kids. I would just <laughs> do it. I would just like run upstairs right, and just like right. start covering my my children uh in kisses. And that actually, I think, brings up this other question that I that I wanted to ask you in a personal way. You're a dad now. You've got a son. You've got a daughter. Um, what did what did your dad teach you about being a dad that is with you now? Do you do you interact with your kids and 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 recognize your dad in yourself for oh, good yeah. or for bad? Absolutely. Um, I you know my dad was real good at just taking joy in us. He just loved having his boys around. He and and I don't I don't know 
I don't know how that concept for me is the most important one of parenting. I don't know why exactly that's true. Because because they true. were absent from your from your early life. I mean, but it also taking joy in your kids speaks to so many other things that have to exist first. You, that means you also have to not be putting tremendous pressure on them to be like you, to not be like you, to achieve something, to not to avoid something. It means you're also making sure that they have appropriate boundaries in their life, that their boundaries expand as they get older. I mean, it's a complex equation, but mm -hmm. at, the, at the core of it is there's a relationship there in which we're just, I just love being around them. We have lots of little jokes um, my, my baby girl, we already have little jokes and she's, you know, five months old. And I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I got that from my dad. I feel like I got a really good playbook for being a dad from my mm. father that I got later in life. I mean, I had somebody interview, I did an interview last week and someone was like, well, you know, at three years old, what was your dad like? And I was like, oh, I, was in <laughs> um, I couldn't tell you what it was like. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, I feel like I have I have a playbook in my head. I can talk to him. I can ask him questions, and um, I feel I feel like as a parent, maybe there's something too about um, you know my dad's a real masculine dude, um, and like I I will like right over here if you were to look off camera, there is a homemade prison style weightlifting gym, like literally a bench press, <laughs> and then a '66 Chevy, a bunch of guitar amps, you know, some dumbbells, and I just like my my circular saw, my screw gun, like, it's all just like, whatever. So we're yeah. liking that way. Man stuff, man, man stuff. stuff. But like, you know, I'm very affectionate with my son. You know, he, he, he comes upstairs to snuggle with daddy. And then we sit and we watch a movie together. Mm -hmm. He just snuggles up on me. And my dad was like that too. He's very affectionate with us. And so I never saw this contra like, as it's some sort of contradiction between masculinity and kindness for mm -hmm. me, it was always just one thing that be yeah. like yeah you're kind of both you're masculine and you're kind you're masculine and you're not a dick you're masculine and you support the woman in your life and you honor that relationship in your life and these are things my dad like he had eighth grade education and he was in prison and he was a heroin addict but he knew some profound things yeah all right let's talk about writing again. let's get let's get back to writing shall we um i like how so the parts of this are like kind of like therapy and i'm like brother tell me Tell me more about what happened. To you. Yeah, let's talk about my dad a little bit. Yeah, um, uh, I, I feel like the book sometimes, like I don't, part of the unmasking thing with the book is I never talk about this stuff. Like in my, in my yeah. answer is always like, keep it going, keep it like, to put on a show, here we go. Ba, 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 da, ba. Mm -mm, and then, mm -mm. But then in the interviews for the book, we can't because the book is really heavy because the whole point of the book is it's trying to take the performer down and be That's like, right. all right, what really, what really happened? What really created you know this what this does it mean yeah life. uh it's not just a book it's an album uh which i honestly cannot stop listening to i'm just obsessed with it i i i just love it i want to talk a little bit about the way in which um and we're gonna talk we'll we'll dig, dig deep into the into the music for a second but the way in which the book influenced the album and and vice versa right i mean um the book came first right uh there was Sort of. I think I might have written a couple songs for the record first, but it was all kind of simultaneous. It wasn't really simultaneous. I think from the outside, we'll talk about that process. So, like, you would. It wasn't what, a decision. What, it was just instinct. I just kind of decided yeah. to write a song, and then I decided to write a book, and then it. Then it, halfway through the book, I wanted to write some more songs, and then I realized I needed to finish the book, and then I was like, oh, I got to finish the record. And then when it was all over, I was like, Oh yeah, I made a book, and then I made a record that was the soundtrack to the book. But that's not how I experienced it. I just sort of experienced it as like works of art that had to be made in the world because I couldn't sit with them in my own head. They had to be externalized. But were there, there were moments in which you would write a scene and then you would think to yourself, there's another way to express this. There's another yeah. way to, to put this down. And it, there's prose and there's music. And, and you know, so uh, here's a, there's, there's a great example of this. I'm just going to read it. This is kind of the end of the, um, the first section here, and this is this is a a moment just to catch everybody up in which um, the your mom's kind of newest boy, um, newest dad, um, uh, beats the shit out of you, and and you run away, and you're um, in Salem, Oregon, and you're and you're kind of looking down uh, at this at this bridge, wondering if maybe you should jump. Uh, I'll just read this moment here. I see the faces of the women and men in their cars staring at the boy smoking a cigarette alone on the West Salem Bridge on a Sunday night. I know there is nowhere to run and no place to sleep. I think the house is an illusion. Under it is frozen ground beneath that lake of black water. I can disappear in the current like a rock falling off a bridge. 
the boys in those cars on their way to Sunday dinner to mash potatoes and pot roast rolls with butter. I feel sorry for them. I am a shadow. I am the shadow of a shadow. It feels good to let the nothingness fill me. What breaks your fall? I toss a rock and watch it arc over the river and disappear. I know how the conversation will go if I go home. Where have you been? What have you been doing? Come on, out with it. You don't deserve to know. You smell like cigarettes. Did you steal them? Are you drinking? You know you're at risk for becoming an alcoholic. It's a family disease. Yes, I know that. Tell me the truth. Don't you lie to me, mister. The truth, the truth, the truth. Come on, out with it. I don't have an answer. No words make sense. Paul is dead. Doug is a monster. The house is an illusion. There is only this frozen ground, this river of black water, this empty well, this blankness, these ghosts. Nothing to do but forget about shelter and become the storm. You finish writing this moment and do you think to yourself, there's, a, there's another emotion that, that I have to express. And then you pull out a guitar? <laughs> I think um, I, it was more that I had a, an arrangement for a song that I liked. Um, and then I, um, was, I started singing about this moment. And then I went back to the, what I had written and was like, oh, this would make for some good song lyrics. And then <laughs> it became sort of this like back and forth, this kind of interplay. And this happens three or four times in the book and the record where a line from the book is it just becomes a direct song lyric. Um, uh, but kind of interpreted with a slightly different emotion. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's weird because I, I think there's probably a thousand rules that I have in my head for how I do these things with songwriting. But like as a songwriter, I just I don't I don't know how to analyze them that that well. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like the line. I, I as a writer, I I feel way more comfortable sort of dissecting, and digressing, and bullshitting and talking. And get, like it's like that part of my head really really feels comfortable in words and right. ideas and feel very facile. Uh, with music, it's much more, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, probably I'm a better writer than a musician, um, if I'm really being honest with myself. <laughs> we're, we're pretty um, but um, I just really love to play music. It's just more fun. And so it's like if you can choose to make part of your life or most of your life, or let's say for me, the last 12 years of your life, like you get to go on tour and play for thousands of people all the time. What a great choice. You know, <laughs> uh, I just love it. I just love it. And um, having written um, is the only uh, acceptable moment for a writer. Not writing is torture. Writing is torture. Having written, that's the only good moment. <laughs> yep. Are you, Are you kidding me? Like, you get all kinds of great moments. You're in the studio. You're hanging like, out with friends. You're doing an acoustic show. You're doing the thing. You're, you know, you get people wanting your autograph. You're singing the show. Everyone's clapping. There's so much more sort of visceral um, kind of feedback. It's a fun yeah. world to, to be in. And as an artist, you get to really experience probably more than anybody else, an actor, unless you're a stage actor, um, you know, a composer, I don't know, a sculptor, you get to really experience other people enjoying the thing that you make. Um, so I think when I wrote the song, um, yeah, I was just kind of in that world. I don't know why things have to be written. Um, I just felt like it had to be written down. Just happens. And then I could, I yeah. could externalize it. I could look at it. I could think about it. I could, I could tell the story in a different way that made emotional sense to me, I guess. Yeah. Can you play a song for us? Oh, yeah. For those of you at home, uh, Rez and I set this up. So <laughs> I feel like we should just be honest with you about that because otherwise it's going to seem like, wait a minute. Hey, you just, what? You have a guitar? What? Set this up. What a coincidence. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So. Let me get let me grab a, a, a tune so one of the important attributes of being a stage performer and i've played about 1500 shows if you're on stage every night is to learn how to be able to tell a story while you have to do something technical well like tuning yeah you're, you're plugging in a guitar <laughs> sometimes you're tuning something sometimes you're checking a mic sometimes they just like the drum head came off and they have to replace the kick drum and you have like two minutes to kill in front of a bunch of people. And so you learn to have these sound bites that fit into exactly the amount of time you have. Black lungs, headlights, 
Heading on to the city tonight Out the front door Turn right I was alone All right, all right, all right I wonder what they'll think of me I run away Run away, this is my town, my night Heading off to the city tonight And she said, come on out with it 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 Hard words on a hard night I'll have a beer, won't you turn out the light From the front door I could hear you right I'm just running dumb, 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 dumb I wonder if I'll be turning back I got 20 bucks in a pocket with my stash I'm not afraid, I'm not your good night I'm just a shadow of the shadows tonight And she said, come on out with it 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 The night shadows watching The darkness approaching You came for life in the park so you stand on the stage at such a young age As you're feeling around in the dark And your mother, she's calling You feel your hopes falling There's nowhere to run to tonight Just the fist on your face now You hope to replace her The emptiness fills you inside Break my fall break my fall break my fall break my fall please break my fall break my fall Come on out with it, 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 come on out with it. Come on out with it. Come on out with it. Put me back in. Nice. I love that song. It's like it's like this thing that just like plays in my head constantly, like when I'm trying to sleep I'm and do sorry. other things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you were talking about the different ways in which you know music happens music writing happens as opposed to prose writing it reminded me of a quote from bowie in your book you you, you get to live everybody's fantasy which is you get to uh be in a room at the same time with david bowie yeah. uh, you're you're a journalist you're a music music journalist and and you're interviewing him and he says this thing where he's talking about the difference between writing prose right and writing and writing songs right yeah. writing music this is this is what he says i think a prose writer can articulate ideas in a more straightforward way but with a musician the words are like a plaster that i lay on this armature of music that's david bowie saying armature of yeah. music everybody i don't see the words as carrying thoughts particularly it's more like an array of feathers which produce a pattern and the totality of that pattern set against this armature of music is enough to express what I'm feeling. Mm. God damn. <laughs> like, I mean, God damn, right? 
I mean, Jesus, he's good. David Bowie. Is that how? Is that the the experience is like for you? The difference between sitting down at your computer, writing prose, writing scenes, and trying to, and then and then the the difference with that and writing music, which is instead this plaster, right? This plaster on the armature of music. It, what what's what's the experience like for you? The difference between those two ways of writing. I, I mean, I think it, when it comes right down to it, David Bowie's just a better musician i mean i <laughs> and i'm I'm not being like falsely humble when i say that I, th I think a lot of my music um career is based on being able to write good lyrics and i think i think in complete sentences i think in terms of stories i think in terms of story arc and mm. um i feel um you know so when i sit down to do it a lot of times i am actually just trying to wrestle with the problem and trying to put it to a melody and arrangement and a score for the lyrics um, but that isn't really what music is. I mean, I love Bon Iver. I, I have no fucking idea what that guy's talking about. Great. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, that's not a diss on him. He's a great musician. You yeah. know, uh, M83 is um, amazing. I don't know what the fuck M83 is talking about. I have no idea. And so I think when we talk, this is why they say like, you know, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Like, we, mm -hmm. we don't really have a language for what music's really doing. And I think what it's really doing isn't actually expressing just, you know, a melody and a lyric and, you know, then you remember a thing. It's that we, it's a very efficient form of communication. Melody, the rise and fall of a voice, the delivery, the rhythm of the delivery, which is also extremely important. Right. Uh, it's something we're used to hearing. And so, um, you know, two million years of human evolution has been spent, you know, telling stories around a, a fire, um, singing songs about our, um, and, you know, at one point it was to make, you know, to understand our ancestors, or maybe it was to make tools or something like the, the whole point is it's all sort of heuristic uh, for us to understand story through song. And it's more than just what's being said. I'd say 80% of it's how it's being said. And mm -hmm. so um, if I was to stop and analyze myself, I think I think like a writer. And it's probably explains why I, I, I personally, I think I'm a better writer than musician. Like I, I just feel way more comfortable with words. I just feel like, okay, let's, we're going to write an essay. We're going to write a screenplay. We're going to write a novel. We're going to write a memoir. We're going to write it. We're going to write. Okay. I got you. Shut up. I'm going to write. Like as a musician, I feel, I feel kind of like a charlatan and mm -hmm. I feel lucky to have the career that I have. I feel lucky that people want to hear what I have to say. I feel lucky that I get to show up and, and sing songs and stuff, but um, so I think when he when he says those things, he has probably a more profound understanding of it than I do. You actually, it's funny because there's this wonderful scene at the end of the book. It's the first time that you're, um, you know, performing with with your band, right? The first big time that you're performing with your band, and I couldn't help but notice the way that you describe it. You say that it's like being the captain of a spaceship, and the reason why that set off alarm bells for me is because I had to immediately go to, you know, the beginning of the book. And the beginning of the book, of course, as we've already talked about, your mom shows up, steals you from this cult, and you and your mom and your brother move into this shitty apartment. Um, and you describe the apartment as looking like a spaceship. And you know, I'm I'm immediately like putting my like you know psychology hat on, right? Where I'm just like, oh, I get it, I get it. I mean, being on stage, the front man, the guy singing your songs with the guitar, it's an act of control for you, isn't it? It's a <laughs> way like you're the you, you you this moment where it's like you're you're in the spaceship. You have no control of this spaceship, this apartment where like your shoes are the table and your clothes are the furniture. And then here you are in this moment where you're the captain of the spaceship. Is is the the process of putting of putting emotions into words, universal emotions, taking individual experiences and transforming them into universal emotions. Is that an act of control for you? Is it a way of, of, of being in control of those emotions? Are you talking about songwriting in particular, just in yeah, general? Yeah, songwriting, yeah. No. And no, performing. I'm not that good at it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Like, I, <laughs> I'm lucky. Like, <laughs> I'm good at writing and I'm decent at rock and roll. And I think I'm a good performer and my band is good live. That's honestly what I think. 
I don't think I think David Bowie is a genius. Um, Lou Reed was a genius, you know. Um, I don't know, Roberta Flack. I mean, go go listen to the first time ever I saw your face and listen to her intonation of her voice. I can't do mm -hmm. that. I can't do I have a I have a I have a scratchy low voice that when you put the right effects on it, it sounds pretty cool. Like I, I just I, I don't want to pretend to know about these things. Like I don't. I, I don't. And so um, no, it's not an act of control. It, I'm I'm just trying to perform and bring the song to life. And I'm just so I'm so fucking like surprised everyone showed up. <laughs> that's, that's always the feeling I have. I take the stage and I always think, holy shit, they're they're totally here. <laughs> I I totally thought they were gonna because in my mind for the previous 22 hours, and those of you who read the book will understand why this is true. All that's holding on my hand is no one's going to show up. You suck at everything. No one's going to show up. You suck at everything. Like that's all that's going in a loop in my head. And so when I show up and it's like, oh, yeah, they're here. This is great. Like, and then I look at the band and they're like, look, they're here. They're like, I know. The fucking, we've been telling you that for a thousand shows now. And I'm, and you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm an idiot. And, and then we perform and it's just exciting because we're all in the same room. And that feels like a celebration of, of life. And I, and I think that's part of why my band is good live is that, that the audience is probably picking up on you know, let's be frank, my attitude about it, my my gratitude for their being there and my sense that like, okay, well, we all hear the guitars are plugged in. Let's make this the last night. Well, yeah, there we go. Let's kind of <laughs> have a circus. Now there's those that'll say that's what rock and roll is. You know, what rock and roll is having, a, you know, a group of people that understand it's the last night on earth. And if it's not the last night on earth, it's not rock and roll. It's folk or it's, <laughs> you know, it's something else. Rock and roll is, is, is the last night on earth. We're all going to die tomorrow. What are we doing tonight? And what we're doing tonight is we're having a revival, we're having a confession, and we're having a circus, and we're going to do it all together. And there's going to be something spiritual about it that's also just really fucking fun and and visceral. So I, I do think like that's actually a really good example of like I can tell you what writing's like, I can tell you what performing's like, and I think I'm good at those things. David Bowie, Prince, Roberta Flack, they're good at music. I'm an okay musician. You know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. like when you ask me these questions, I could pontificate, but who fucking cares? I'm <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's round out this conversation uh, and talk about what you and I really want to talk about, uh, oh, boy, which is the fucking out. world. Yeah, the fucking world. Um, look, um, it's no, uh, I think, a surprise to people that you're very politically active. You actually come from a very politically active family. Right. I mean, your mom was a protester. Your dad was was deeply political. You grew up like this. But, you know, you look at the world around you right now and and you have been very vocal um, on social media and, and elsewhere about um, what's happening with Trump. But more specifically, and, and I think you and I have kind of shared this this similar idea about um, what we call the Trump cult. Right, this sort of thirty percent of the country that you know doesn't it's care if he's it's like 35, 36%, whatever of the like country. 40? Is it 25? <laughs> maybe well, oh, like, no, like, like, I was too optimistic. Okay, 35, 35. There's like a hundred million Americans. So that's oh, wow. that's 30%. That's, that's a hundred million Americans who Hard. really don't care if he shoots somebody on Fifth Avenue, who really don't care if he cages uh, children, or if he sends, you know, um, jackbooted thugs, you know, onto the streets to arrest people and put them into minivans and things like that. And uh, I've written a lot about how this is very much cult-like behavior. Um, you've also talked about the fact that it's cult-like behavior. You actually <laughs> came out of a cult, so I feel I like, like how this is like you want to talk cults. Yeah, I was, was going to say, you, and I'm like, hey, I'm the Obama guy. Exactly. Um, this is, like this the, is cult, the cult where the fucking boomer, my fucking boomer parents. <laughs> I didn't do that shit. I'm the pragmatic guy. But, but nevertheless, you have you have a a sort of unique perspective into yeah. cult behavior. You know why people join cults. What cults do to to someone? So when you look at that thirty percent, right? Um, is there something about your background, your experience, that allows you to think about it differently, to maybe yeah. sympathize with the way that they think? And also, is there something about your background that can help them to sort of break free of what is unquestionably cultish behavior? 
a cult of personality in this case. Yeah, I don't know if I can if I'm the guy who has an answers about how to what to do about it. I think that's a really complicated question. And if any if the answer was simple, we would have it by now. I, I will say this. I don't hate Trump supporters. Um, I'm very, very angry at Trump supporters and I'm mm -hmm. very, very disappointed at Trump supporters. And I as an activist, you know, you're taught and you believe and you think about you center your own experience, the experience of the victims, you don't center the experience of the perpetrator, right? The perpetrators in this case are people who are like, yeah, let's throw that El Salvadorian child in a cage. So we don't stop and go, well, let's think about his childhood. How was he raised to be like, fuck him. You shouldn't put him in a fucking cage. That's a kid. The kid doesn't belong in a fucking cage. That's a cop that killed a man. That man shouldn't have been killed. So, so I want to be really clear. I, I don't think that people aren't culpable and they're not worthy or deserving of anger. Yeah. I do. And I think anger is a, probably righteous anger is the right response to Trumpism and that like anything that sort of like tries to reason with it is wrong. It, we, the people need to feel real human emotions because that's how we learn. Right. Mm -hmm. If I said something to you and I don't know, you know, made some comment about, I don't something and it offended you or upset you. And you're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why the fuck would you say it to me? I, I would learn from that experience. Like, Cause as a human who experiences empathy, I would be like, Oh, I, I stepped into it here. Okay. Shit. I better learn about this new thing that I didn't know about. And Twitter's pretty good with that. Twitter's pretty good at teaching you like, <laughs> just like, Oh, fuck that, okay. uh, fuck that, okay. and then kind of learning. Like, okay. Here's, here's, here's what I'm putting into the world. And here's what I need to understand about other people's experience. So, the, the right response to Trumpism is anger. Now, having said that, you know, um, there's a lot of propaganda. And so you've got a lot of people who are watching Fox News every fucking day. They're in a bubble They're They don't know the truth. They don't like because, you know, parts of this country, Fox News is on at the dentist office. It's not considered, you know, this weird right wing propaganda outlet. It's considered just the news. So part of the problem is in Germany, you can't have Fox News. In Norway, mm -hmm. in Sweden, in Switzerland, in, in, you fucking can't. You can't have Fox News. You can't call something the news if it's actually propaganda. And that used to be true in the United States. And in 1982, Reagan repealed that law. Or not Reagan, but Reagan's Congress. And, and Fox News was born. So I would say 60% of the problem is Fox News. The other 40% is just old school straight up American racism. And I think that, you know, America's original sin is racism. And it would make sense that if Trump in some ways, the sort of undoing of America, it's based on the original sin. It's people would rather have their white supremacy than have a country. They literally would choose the idiot who can't govern over who, who reminds them of how big they feel because they're mediocre white men. It's all they got. And I've experienced this in my own family. So I feel like I know what I'm talking about. You know, I don't have much else. How do I feel superior? I feel superior by, you know, these lefties don't know what the fuck they're talking about. These libtards are, oh, have you thought about this libtard? And you're like, yeah, that was like freshman year of college, propaganda 101. I fucking thought, like, yeah, of course I thought about that. What the fuck are you talking about? So, you know, um, yeah, but, but here's I the thing I, I don't want to, I don't mean to interrupt because the racism is obvious. Um, the, the sort of, you know, the politics. Uh, Fox News works very much, you know, the way that cults work. Cults, cults succeed by blocking out all other alternative information, creating a siege mentality. Control. You have yeah. a leader. Anyone who disagrees with the leader right. is a heretic. Heretics are cast out. Soul access to truth. The point of a knife. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. All that stuff. Can you beyond beyond those things which are undeniable? Can you, as someone who grew around, grew up around people who who did find you know a sense of purpose inside of a cult that was clearly violent and clearly you know um, a, t a toxic uh, environment, can you sort of understand what it is that draws someone to this cult of? Yeah, Trump? I mean, you've written about this, Reza. It's the same reason that people are drawn to religion. People want answers people want certainty and it's really nice to be told here's what the problems are in the world it's the mexicans here's the one thing that you can believe and if you believe this one thing then you're going to have the answer it simplifies yeah. the world in these tremendous yeah. ways that as sort of generally left kind of people that are interested in open dialogue and understand how complex and difficult and frankly fucked up the world is right now i would love that 
That would be great. It would. I would so much rather have that certainty than be like, oh, we're fucked. We're fucked in like 20 ways right now. Like, I don't even mm -hmm. I don't know where to start with how fucked we are. Like, and, and so, yeah, the cult offers a certainty. The cult offers you yeah. um, a really easy balm for your feelings of anxiety and fear and dread um, about the world, which is frankly, you know, and I'm, I'm not an atheist. So, but, but a lot of organized religion offers um, as well. And, what you know it, it it's sort of an organizing principle for for human beings right mm -hmm. so i i mean I, I think that's what trump offers yeah blame the mexicans even though it's not mm -hmm. true we're not going to worry about facts we're just going to stay like blame the mexicans and then it's like yeah it's them it feels and good like, what about that guy that you started your business with pedro who's like your best friend well not him of course he's a good mexican and it's like man no he is the person we're talking about it's exactly yeah. Pedro. It's exactly this person. It's the, the human being that, that we're talking about. And, and it's actually very difficult, you know, to, to, to complete that loop, that thought loop uh, for people who've been exposed to propaganda. And I don't think that it makes sense. The social psychologist in me, I studied social psychology in college, um, is like, no, these people aren't worse or better than us. We're not better because we're from uh, our political background. We're not. We're, we're not. Our politics are better. Our politics are better for people, no question. But are we better? No, people are responding to the information that they have. And the information that they have is bad. And it's based on, you know, Malcolm X would tell you that racism is ignorance. It's ignorance. It's people don't know. And in this particular case, I think to some extent, aren't they right? Aren't they right that if you're a mediocre white man, Basically, Trump's kind of your last hurrah because the rest of us are like coming from them blue eyed devils. Like the rest of us are kind of like, fuck you. We're not going to let you pass anymore. Like mm -hmm. I hate white supremacy and I hate white privilege, partially because I don't ever want to be confused with some mediocre son of a bitch who's just kind of fallen his way through life. I, I did not do that. Like I fucking scrapped and I still have white privilege and I don't want it. I want I want I want to I want to just let brilliance be brilliance. But, you know, and I want I, I, I'm on the side of brilliant people. I'm on the side of brilliant black people and brilliant Latino people and brilliant women that have been passed over. I'm not on the side of white people just for being white. It's a silly construct. I'm sorry, I'm going off here. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you are, you know, kind of this mediocre white dude and you've kind of gotten by on living in a country, country of white supremacy and it's not said out loud around you that much because there's not a lot of people deconstructing culture in real time in your in your world aren't you kind of right yeah this is kind of your last hurrah and so what do we do with that when you're like yeah this is the way that this person's going to get a job in five years is to hope that the country remains kind of a bastion of white supremacy because the rest of us aren't going to allow that so I'd say to a certain extent to act like they're all just acting irrationally is wrong. It's more vicious than that. It's more, it's more self-centered than that. It's more selfish than that. It's, it's less, you know, it's not just an accident. So all these things are kind of happening at the same time. Um, and so, you know, how do you educate people? How do you, you know, how do you say like, well, the real answer is you need to get some training and you need to go back to school or you need to open your mind to new experiences so that you can become more marketable or, or whatever it is. You know, um, and I, I, those are hard questions. Tough, and yeah. the thing about cults and the thing about Trump is he takes these hard questions. You know, it's what's happening with the pandemic. Take this hard question. How do you deal with a deadly disease in a country that everyone interacts? Well, you can pretend it doesn't exist. We'll invent a new reality and we're going to pretend in that new reality this, that these difficult questions have a simple answer. The simple answer is this is all just made up. It's a yeah. lie. But it's a really comforting lie, and that's what every cult is. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a society. It's a it's a tribe that organizes itself around a really comforting lie, and the really comforting lie that Trump organizes itself around is that this country's gone to hell because of the blacks and the Mexicans and the libtards, and I'm here to solve it. It's a fucking lie. Well, my whiskey glass is empty, which means it's time for the five questions. All right, rapid fire. That's here we go. That's my mayoral speech, by the way. <laughs> All right, you ready? Five questions. Here we go with Mikel Jolet. Number one, what is your favorite book? Beloved. Why? I, 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 uh, Tony Morrison. Um, you know, brilliant, vexing, probing, interesting, no holes in her game, best American writer. You can make an argument for Philip Roth of the 20th century, but they're neck and neck. They're neck and neck. And right now, I, I think I would probably 10 years ago would have leaned towards Roth, and now I probably lean towards Tony mm. Morrison just because. I recognize such a crazy 
like humanity uh, in how she writes and how she's really willing to to take the interior worlds of people who have lived 150 years ago going through this generational trauma of slavery and make it visceral and real and present for me in a way that I understand now um, uh, having never lived these people's experiences. And so I, I just, I, she's also just fucking, she just makes beautiful paragraphs. Yeah. What is your writing process? And let's talk about songwriting, not prose writing. What's your songwriting process? Oh, I'm an edge of the bed you know, kind of guy. I'm a, I'm a like grab a guitar, um, sit on the edge of the bed. I'm working on a song right now. Do you start with like, melody? Do you start with a line, a chorus? All right. So I just wrote this new song and all I did was I started this line and it goes like this. It was, um, what do you think about getting old? Do you think you're just to do what you're told? Did you ever think maybe you could be so bold and decide to never die? One more. That's what I heard about Jesus Christ. He was born in a barn and he got to live twice. Then they murdered him for being too nice and he went to a throne in the sky. All right, so I wrote I wrote that song. I'm uh, sorry, I wrote that line. And then I thought, okay, what's the song? Because I like that line. I like this whole line. Yeah, I like they that. murdered him for being too nice. Uh, somebody told some lies in here. I'm going to sort of set up from the start that your belief in him has something to do with your fear of death. Um, I, I like those lines. I just they just kind of came out. I don't know where they came from. And then the writer in me was like, okay, so what do we what do we do with that? How do we answer the question? And the question is, what song starts with those two lines? And then I spent, you know, probably five days just doing that, just chasing, <laughs> all right, what's the song that comes from those those two lines that and, and just playing it over and over again, thinking it through, writing, rewriting, writing, rewriting, writing, rewriting. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't a writer. What would you be? And you can't say musician. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, if you would ask me five years ago, I would have, I would thought about running for city council in LA. I thought about a politician. Oh, I don't know though. I'm too much of a, <laughs> I I'm not always, I'm, how do I put this? Um, I don't know if I could, you don't have the discipline, the discipline. I I, no, I'm pretty disciplined. It's not even that. I think I would hate it. I think I could win. I really do. I think I'm pretty mm -hmm. good at giving speeches and you know, you, 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 you have a certain, anyone who's ever run for office also has this artistic side. I've noticed there's kind of this push pull between like, I have to create an identity, tell a story to people, be good at performing and get them to then like me. It's, is the thought process Barack Obama goes through. It's also the thought process Bruce Springsteen goes through. Mm -hmm. Um, Bruce Springsteen went through and and there's something similar about them being kind of like vexed people who are sort of solving the emotional problems in life with this huge abyss of of a need for the approval of others and I have that thing so I think I could win hmm. I just think I'd hate it yeah. I just think like the minute I started city council or and then in my mind I'm like well if I want city council I could probably run for mayor it's only in LA it's not that hard and then like all right I'd be mayor of LA and then well I guess I could run for governor no, all right and like I had that thought like maybe five years ago and like and I just thought like okay the the running would be one thing but then you got to do it and then you got to sit there and they have that council meetings and they're so fucking boring <laughs> and you got to be somewhere at eight Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm still in bed or I'm, or I'm writing a song. How am I going to write the next record? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's honestly it's a, a dystopian novel if I'm at a fucking city council meeting listening to like zoning ordinances and shit. And I was like, all right. It sounds that. like the worst life. It, it people ask me all the time, like, hey, why don't you run for office? And I'm like, that sounds awful. Also, because yeah. I want to get things done. Right. And also, it's like, <laughs> why would you want to wake up and have that be your life and then yeah. have that be how you spent your day? Like, just like the rubber chicken lunches, you know, the rubber chicken circuit. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, I'd yeah. like to thank Bob for his career and service to the sanitation. Or, you know, it's all very, <laughs> it's all a lot more parks and rec. Yeah. yeah. It that, it's, uh, that's you not know, a good one. Yeah. All right. Question number four What is the worst writing advice that you've ever been given? Oh, God. Music, prose, any kind of writing. The worst writing advice that I've ever been given. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I, I think um, what I will say is there's this idea that exists in writing, songwriting, as well as prose writing, that somehow your first draft is is supposed to be like great. There's this that everyone's trying to be Mozart. There's a Mozart complex where it's like, am I? 
am I a generational talent? Am I the once in a generation <laughs> guy? Like young writers or musicians yeah. laugh sometimes they're just starting out and they'll be like, and like, I just want you to hear my song and tell me if I'm any good. And I want to be like, I'll tell you right now, it sucks. <laughs> I don't even need to hear it. I can tell you it sucks. Do it for five years every day, write a thousand more songs or 20 more short stories or 50 more essays or whatever it is. And then like, you're going to get better at it. And that's, that's really what it is. You can, you know, you, if you're a mediocre writer, you can become a pretty good writer. If you're a pretty good writer, you can become a very good writer. And if you're already a good writer, maybe you can become a great writer. And like, you, it, it's going to take time and practice and fucking editing, editing and editing and editing. Like I, my, my book, I, I did 13 drafts before I ever yeah. sent it to an agent or a literary house or anything. And they wouldn't have accepted the first draft. Well, you, it sounds like you answered the the final question, which is what's the best writing advice you can give, which is just write, right? Just write. Read. Actually, read. Read. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't write unless I'm reading. I read about, when I'm writing, I read about four hours a day. Um, I get really into books. I get really into ideas. I, it feels like a tank I'm filling up. And then the next morning when I write, the tank kind of empties out. And and, and, and these things are not as... Um, they're not as one-to-one -one logical as they might seem. There is something that happens when you read a lot and you live in the world of ideas and you engage that part of your brain where writing can come from a place that you don't expect. And I don't know if that happens with music or not, but with reading, it definitely happens. Like, you know, Vonnegut talks about reading as these Buddhist catnaps. <laughs> you have a moment of sort of like, you're almost like a meditation where you're reading a book and, and pretty soon your mind and the, and, the, and the writer's mind become melded. So, you know, if you want to be a writer, there's worse things you can do than melding your mind with great writers every day for a long time. Yeah. And editing, 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 and more editing. The book is called Hollywood Park, and it's also a companion album. They're both fantastic. Mikhail Jolet, thank you so much for you, being Robert. on Rough Draft Live. Uh, if you guys want to uh, watch uh, Rough Draft episodes, you can go to Topic.com and you can plug in the code 92SY, 92SY, uh, and get a couple of months free of that service and watch uh, all our back episodes of Rough Draft Live. But first, let me just once again thank you, Mikkel, for taking time to be with us. This was a fantastic conversation. I love speaking with you. I How's your whiskey? whiskey? You done? Is the bottle empty? Oh, God, no. I actually, it's funny. I was just thinking, I have some big calls tomorrow. I have some like actually kind of big things that, and I was thinking, I was like looking at the bottle, like, is that too much? Okay, that's probably enough. I can still have a reasonable conversation. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for joining us uh, here on StreamYard. We'll see you next week for another episode of Rough Draft Live with our guest, Bess Kalb. Don't miss that hey, one. It's going to be really fun. I say hello. I will. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.